So in this video, we're going to take a look at the naming and drawing of three different classes of organic compounds. We're going to focus in this video on alcohols, carboxylic acids, and esters. These are three different types of organic molecules that are characterized by certain groups of atoms within the molecule. So a certain group of atoms, when you see that molecule, will tell you that you're looking at an alcohol or that you're looking at a carboxylic acid. That group of molecules that tells you what type of molecule you're looking at is referred to as a functional group. So the functional group determines which type of molecule you're looking at. To begin with, we're going to look at alcohols. The alcohol is an organic molecule where the hydrocarbon has what's referred to as a hydroxyl functional group. Make sure you know this name. It's a hydroxyl group, and it looks like OH. Now you might be thinking to yourself that OH is actually the hydroxide ion. So hydroxide is a complex ion, which is OH negative. But that's an ion. It's a negatively charged ion, and it would be part of an ionic compound. It would have to have a cation to go with it. In this situation, we're looking at organic molecules, and these are, these are molecular substances. They're not ionic. So the OH group, even though it looks like a hydroxide ion, it's not. It's covalently bonded to a carbon atom. But because it's still made of OH, we give it a similar name. We call it the hydroxyl group. Sometimes I'll just say the alcohol group but keep in mind it's actually called a hydroxyl group. Now we know from earlier discussions that a carbon-hydrogen bond in a hydrocarbon is nonpolar. You might also want to make a note for yourself that carbon-carbon bonds in hydrocarbons are nonpolar. The reason they're nonpolar is the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms is very small. It's less than 0.4 Paulings. On the other hand, an OH bond, the bond that you see in the hydroxyl group, is very polar. It's a polar covalent bond. The difference in electronegativity there is actually reasonably large. You might also note that the carbon-oxygen bond is also polar, but not quite as polar as the OH bond. Okay, so OH is a polar bond, CO is a polar bond. In both of those cases, the oxygen atom is more electronegative. So O is more electronegative than H, O is more electronegative than C. The more electronegative atom attracts the electrons within the bond, and then the more electronegative atom, the oxygen in those two cases, becomes partially negative, while the other atom, the hydrogen or the carbon, becomes partially positive. This is a handout that you have in your organic booklet. Make sure you've got this with you. Um, in this diagram of the alcohol called ethanol, you've done some organic already, so you know that ethanol must have two carbons. Take a pen or pencil in your, in your booklet and circle that molecule, CH3, CH2, OH. That is the ethanol molecule, two carbons long with a hydroxyl group, OH. This diagram is showing what happens when you put ethanol into water. You can see two water molecules on the right-hand side interacting or hydrating the ethanol molecule. The question below says to label partial negatives. This is the delta symbol, which means partial charge. So partial negatives and partial positives in both the water and alcohol molecules. So looking at this, pause the video and try it yourself. I hope you labeled the oxygens in both molecules, in all three of these molecules rather, as partially negative, 
and the hydrogens in those molecules as partially positive. So the O's are partially negative, while the H's are partially positive. Now that we see those partial charges, we understand that there's going to be intramolecular forces of attraction, the positives and negatives attract, and those are indicated with these dotted lines. We've seen this in earlier units on inter with intramolecular forces, so we know that those dotted lines are actually hydrogen bonds. They're a form of dipole-dipole uh, forces, but they're actually hydrogen bonds. Now, when you look at the rest of the alcohol molecule, notice on the, right, on the left hand side, the CH3 and the CH2, that part of the molecule is actually, I shouldn't have erased that, is actually nonpolar. So the alcohol has a nonpolar part, the carbons and hydrogens, and it has a polar part. The polar part is the OH group, the hydroxyl group. Now, in the ethanol molecule, the nonpolar portion is quite small. It's only got two carbons in it. So in this situation, the very polar hydroxyl group predominates, and the interactions it has with water means that ethanol is going to be quite soluble in water. Now, in other alcohols, the nonpolar part can get to be quite long, quite large. Maybe the nonpolar part has not just two carbons, but perhaps it has eight, nine, ten, fifteen carbons. The longer the nonpolar part gets, the more important the nonpolar portion of the alcohol molecule becomes when you're thinking of intermolecular forces. So if that nonpolar part was very large, let's say 15 or 20 carbons long, then the solubility of this alcohol in water would drop significantly. So if you remember that nonpolar substances are not going to be that soluble in, a, in water, which is, which is quite polar. So you have this situation with small alcohols, the very small nonpolar portion means that the polar hydroxyl group is the most important part. But in really long alcohols, the nonpolar portion could actually become more important when you're thinking of intramolecular forces. Um, this molecule was called ethanol because it has two carbons. You should make a note for yourself that ethanol is the alcohol that we drink. So this is the alcohol that's found in any alcoholic or any alcohol beverage, things that you drink. So beer or wine, things like that, they have ethanol in them. In the second part of the, of the question, it shows you another alcohol. We know this is an alcohol because we see this OH functional group, the hydroxyl group. In this molecule, there's only one carbon. So what do you think the name would be? Well, if a two-carbon alcohol was called ethanol, a one-carbon alcohol will be called methanol. The question says, draw two water molecules showing the hydration of this methanol molecule. So pause the video and try that on your own handout. We know that the oxygen is partially negative, the hydrogen is partially positive. So if I draw two water molecules, I can show one water molecule up here It'll be oriented with its partially negative oxygen attracted to the partially positive hydrogen in our alcohol. I can put another alcohol, I'm sorry, another water molecule over here, and I can show that its hydrogen atom, which is partially positive, is going to be attracted to the partially negative oxygen in the alcohol. And again, those dotted lines would represent hydrogen bonding between the water and the alcohol. 
An important point to note is that methanol, that's an alcohol that we actually used in our grade 9 science course, methanol is a highly toxic alcohol. All alcohols are poisonous to humans. We have an ability through evolution to partially, to, to basically, we can digest, we can break down ethanol, but it does take some time to do that in our bodies. We don't have mechanisms in our bodies to break down things like methanol or other alcohols. So other alcohols are very highly toxic to, to humans. Ethanol is moderately toxic. If you take enough ethanol, if you drink too much too quickly, ethanol could actually kill you as well. So those are two examples of alcohols. We know they're alcohols because of those hydroxyl groups. In the second question, we're being asked to give UPAC names for these different alcohols. We're going to use actually both the UPAC naming and American naming. Take a look at the first example. And you notice we see a problem here that we didn't notice with the other two examples in the, in the earlier question. This alcohol, we can see it's an alcohol because of this OH functional group, the hydroxyl group. The alcohol has one, two, three, four carbons. So now we have to say where the hydroxyl group is. In this particular molecule, it's on the first carbon counting from the end closest to the hydroxyl group. Since it's on the first carbon in the group, in the molecule, and it has four carbons in the molecule, its name in the American system would be 1-butanol. The 1 is saying that the hydroxyl group is on the first carbon in the parent chain. The UPAC way to do it, the way I prefer you do it on my, on my tests and assignments, would be butane without the E. We drop the E, and then we say dash one all. So butane one all would be the UPAC way of saying it. Take a look at the second molecule. Pause the video and try to name it. Hopefully you noticed that it's an alcohol because of this hydroxyl group. You noticed that the parent chain has three carbons in it. And you notice that the hydroxyl group is on the second carbon in that molecule. So the American way of saying it would be 2-propanol. And the UPAC way of saying it would be propane without the E dash to all. Now that molecule has an older name which is actually still quite common and, and you should know it. Its older name is isopropyl alcohol. Some people would even say isopropanol but isopropyl alcohol is quite common. It also has a, has a common name. You can buy this alcohol at the drugstore. It's rubbing alcohol. You might have it at home in the bathroom. It's used for disinfecting skin and small cuts and things. Let's do one more example here. How about part E? Pause the video and see if you can name it. Notice that this molecule is branched. Can you apply what we learned earlier and, and give me its name? So we notice again the hydroxyl group, which tells us it's an alcohol. That's the functional group that identifies the alcohol. The parent chain, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons long. And that alcohol group is on the second carbon. You have to count from the end closest to the alcohol group. We also notice that there is a branch the branch is a methyl branch, and we're going to have to count from the end closest to the alcohol group. So the branch is on, starting from the right-hand side, one, two, three, four. It's on the fourth carbon in that six-carbon chain. So putting all this together, we name the branch 
four methyl, and then the six carbon chain, hexane without the E, dash, and then we can see it's on the second carbon, the alcohol group, so two all. That would be the UPAC way of doing it. The American way would be four methyl, two hexanol. Four methyl, two hexanol. Now, what's the chemical formulas of these alcohols? Notice that an alcohol can be thought of as an alkane with an OH attached. To attach the OH, you'd have to remove one hydrogen from the alkane. So when I look at this name, 4-methylhexane-2-ol, I can see it's an alcohol because of the OL at the end. I can tell it has seven carbons, so C7. The number of hydrogen, hydrogens, I start by thinking about how many hydrogens an alkane would have, 2N plus 2. So if you have seven carbons, there would normally have been 16 hydrogens. I take one of those hydrogens away, I'll say H15, and I took that hydrogen away so that I could attach the hydroxyl group, OH. So C7, H15, OH would be the formula of that alcohol. Looking back at question B, do the same thing. You notice, looking at the name, that it's an alcohol. You can see that it's got three carbons. So C3 would be your starting point. You think of it first as an alkane. And you think, well, three carbons, it should have eight hydrogens. You take one of those hydrogens away, so H7, and you attach your hydroxyl group, OH. So there's the basic formula of an alcohol. You can finish question two. Notice that in the, I'll, I'll just leave it there. So question two. I'm going to give you some information that's not here on the page. You might want to write this down in your margin. I'll write it down at the top here. Alcohols can be classified or uh, categorized into three different types. There are primary alcohols. We, we can just write one degree. We, we say primary, but you can abbreviate it as one degree. Don't say one degree, say primary. There's secondary alcohols. You can abbreviate that two degree. And then there's tertiary alcohols, three degree. How do we apply that to alcohols? Well, let's look at 2A. Find your hydroxyl group, and then circle the carbon that it's attached to. So, so this, let me just erase the highlighting. This is the carbon that the alcohol group is attached to. Now, ask yourself, how many carbons are attached to that carbon? How many carbons are attached to the carbon that has the alcohol group on it? Well, in this case, there's only one carbon attached. So therefore, this is a primary alcohol. Look at the next one. How many, first of all, circle, or at least notice in your, in your mind, the carbon that has the alcohol group attached. That'll be this carbon. Now ask yourself, how many other carbons are attached to that carbon? The answer is two. There are two carbons attached to that carbon. Therefore, this is a secondary alcohol. I'll sh there, we don't have an example on this page, but let me show you a tertiary alcohol. You can draw this yourself if you like. I'll put an alcohol and a hydroxyl group there. I'll put a methyl branch there as well. Okay, so draw that. My claim is that that's going to be a tertiary alcohol. Do you agree? Notice the carbon that the alcohol group is attached to. 
And the question is, how many carbons are bonded to that? Well, there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. Three carbons are attached to that carbon, therefore it's a tertiary alcohol. Okay? As you do these questions, you might want to practice that by also labeling them as primary, secondary, or tertiary. The next page asks you to draw some molecules, and it gives us the American names for them. Let's do question B and maybe question C. So how would you draw 3-methyl-1-hexanol? Start by looking at the end of the molecule, and you notice the OL tells you that it's an alcohol. Hexanol means it's got six carbons in the parent chain. So let's draw that. One, two, three, four, five, six. One hexanol is saying that the alcohol group, the hydroxyl group, is on the first carbon in the molecule. Well, right now, you could consider the first carbon to be either the one on the left or the one on the right. Whichever one you pick would be carbon number one. I'll put it on the right. So I'm going to add my hydroxyl group over there. So that is 1-hexanol, or hexane 1-all, according to UPAC. Now there's a branch, 3-methyl. The key is that you have to continue counting from the same end you counted for the alcohol group. Since I put the alcohol group on the far right, that carbon is carbon 1, carbon 2, and carbon 3. So for 3-methyl, I have to put my methyl branch over there. So that would be my molecule. You wouldn't normally include those little numbers. So that's 3-methyl, 1-hexanol. What's its chemical formula? Well, it has a total of 7 carbons, 6 plus 1. So C7 as an alkane, it would have 16 hydrogens, 2N plus 2. I take away one of those hydrogens, H15, and I add my hydroxyl group. Is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? Well, look at the carbon that has the alcohol group attached. How many carbons do you see attached to that? I see only one carbon directly attached to that, so therefore this is a primary alcohol. Another way to think of primary alcohols is an alcohol where the hydroxyl group is terminal. It's at the end of a chain. That would be a primary alcohol. Let's do one more. How about question D? Um, no, I'll do question F. 3-chloro, 2-methyl, two 2-heptanol. Two Pause the video and try to draw that yourself. So heptanol, 7 carbons long, and all tells me it's an alcohol. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 2-heptanol is saying that the alcohol group, the hydroxyl group, is on the second carbon. This time, I'll count from the left. So the alcohol group would be on the second carbon in the chain. Carbon 3 has a chlorine atom. That's what chloro means. I count from the same end that I did for the alcohol, so the chlorine atom would be here. Carbon 2 has a methyl branch. So carbon 2, I put a methyl, excuse me, a methyl branch there. Now, what's the formula of this compound? It's a little bit trickier because there's a chlorine atom in there as well. Well, let's start with our carbons. Heptanol is seven carbons plus the one extra for methyl. This is C8. If it were an alkane, we would have two times eight plus two. We would have had 18 hydrogen. Now, one of those hydrogens was replaced by a chlorine. So now that brings me down to 17 hydrogens. A second hydrogen was replaced by the hydroxyl group. 
So that will bring me down to 16 hydrogens. I'll put my chlorine atom next, and then I'll put the hydroxyl group at the end. The reason I put the hydroxyl at the end is because it then becomes clear visibly that this would be an alcohol. Now, is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? Find the carbon that has the alcohol attached to it right there. How many carbons are attached to it? One, two, three. Therefore, this is a tertiary alcohol. All right. I think I'm going to leave alcohols there. I'll let you finish these questions yourself. Let's move over to question nine, which introduces the next functional group called the carboxyl group. It, for, it forms molecules that are called carboxylic acids. These are organic acids. The carboxyl group has a carbon atom double bonded to an oxygen atom and then it has a hydroxyl group as well, bonded to the carbon. Now, if you count bonds, that carbon has three bonds right now. So therefore, a fourth bond is over here. So that's the carboxyl group. When you name carboxylic acids, the ending of the parent chain will change to oic acid. Okay, we're going to see some examples in just a moment. So part A, the simplest um, carboxylic acid has only one carbon. And where there was that space to add something, there's just a hydrogen attached. Now with one carbon, you might think of the name methane. An alkane with one carbon is called methane. But here, the ending has to be oic acid. So instead of methane, we say methanoic, notice I dropped the E from its ending, and I added oic, so methanoic acid is the name of that molecule. Its older name is formic acid, formic acid from the Latin word ant. There are a species of ant, there's several species I guess, but one famous one that are fire ants, they spray formic acid from their bums, from the, from the tail end of the molecule, as a defense mechanism when they're attacked. So that's methanoic acid. Part B gives us a molecule which is very common. If you've ever used vinegar, vinegar is a 5% solution of acetic acid. That older name is so common that most people still just use it all the time. I call this molecule acetic acid all the time. But what's its correct UPAC name? Well, first of all, I, I didn't do this in the last example, but how do I know this is a carboxylic acid? The answer is that I can see the C double bonded O and the OH. That entire thing is a carboxyl group. It tells me this is a carboxylic acid. It has two carbons, right? If you look at it closely, there's two carbons. So the name that I think of first is ethane. That would be an alkane with two carbons, ethane. But its name has to end in oic acid. So its proper name would be ethanoic acid. Okay, its older name, acetic acid, is much more commonly used, but this is its proper UPAC name. Part C shows us a, a, a carboxylic acid. Again, you can see the C double bonded O and then the OH attached. That's a carboxyl group. And again, it has three carbons this time in the parent chain. Its older name was propionic acid which comes from a Latin name meaning first fat. If you've taken biology, you know that fatty acids are long hydrocarbon chains with carboxyl groups at the end. This very small carboxylic acid 
is the first carboxylic acid that behaves kind of like fatty acids. Therefore, it was called propionic acid, first fat. But what's its proper UPAC name? Three carbons, so the first thing I think of is propane. And then, since I noticed that it's a carboxylic acid, the name becomes propanoic acid. Now, what are their chemical formulas? When you look at the propanoic acid molecule, I'm going to break it off like this. I'm going to take off the carboxyl group, and I'm going to look at just the remaining carbons, and that looks like a height, like an alkane. So when I see a three-carbon carboxylic acid, I take off the carboxyl group, and I think of just two carbons to begin with. As an alkane, that would become C2H what? H6. Now I'm going to take off one of the hydrogens from this alkane, C2H6. That'll leave me with C2H5. Why did I take off a hydrogen? Because then I'm going to add back on the carboxyl group that I had first cut off. COOH is how I'll represent the carboxyl group. Okay. Go back and do the same thing for ethanoic acid. It has two carbons, so take one of those away. You'd have just one carbon left. How many hydrogens would you put on one carbon? The answer is four. Take one of those four hydrogens away, so CH3, and then add on your carboxyl group, COOH. Methanoic acid's a little bit different because the only carbon it has is the carbon that's in the carboxyl group. But that carbon needs one more bond, so you just add a hydrogen at the beginning. There's methanoic acid. Now, carboxylic acids can also be branched. Let's look at a couple of examples in question 10. Can you name 10B? Is it branched? No, it's not. Do you see the carboxyl group? It's at the end of the molecule. Now, that's an important point. Carboxyl groups will always be at the end of the molecule. So you don't need to number them. They're always at the end. So then, how many carbons are in this molecule? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well then, since it's a carboxylic acid, its name becomes hexanoic acid. What's its chemical formula? Well, hexanoic acid has six carbons. I take one of those away, C5, and then I add on hydrogens. If it were an alkane, it would be C5H12. I take away one of those hydrogens, C5H11, and then I add on my carboxyl group. So hexanoic acid. What about, let's take a look at question D. This has a branch. Well, go ahead and name it. You know how to name branched molecules. I can see on the left side of the molecule a carbon with a double bonded oxygen, and that same carbon has the OH. That's a carboxyl group. So this is a carboxylic acid. Next, I'm going to count the carbons in the parent chain. Don't forget the carboxyl carbon. So there's one, two, three, four carbons in the parent chain. It has a branch, a methyl branch, on which carbon? Well, you have to number from the end closest to the functional group. So the functional group is the carboxyl group, so this is carbon 1, and the methyl branch is on carbon 2. So then the name becomes 2-methyl, and then 2-methyl-butanoic acid parent chain had four carbons, so butanoic acid. 
what would be its chemical formula? Well, methyl butanoic acid, that's going to give me five carbons. I take one of those away, so that brings me back down to four carbons. The number of hydrogens in the alkane would have been C4H10. So I take away one of those hydrogens, and I add on my carboxyl group. C4H9, COOH is the formula of that um, carboxylic acid. What about drawing carboxylic acids? Question 11. Let's look at part B. Can we draw 2,3-dichloroheptanoic acid? Heptanoic acid, seven carbons. One, oops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The heptanoic acid is telling me there's a carboxyl group at the end of the chain. I can put it at either end. For this one, I'll put it at the right side. So I'll put a double bond oxygen and an OH attached to that last carbon. Remember that that carbon is carbon-1 in the molecule. So then we have two branches. The branches are both chlorine atoms, dichloro, and they're on carbons 2 and 3. So carbon-2 has a chlorine atom, and carbon-3 has a chlorine atom. There's my molecule. Let me just erase my number. So 2,3-dichloroheptanoic acid. What about question number, or part E? There's a little typo there. That should be 2, 3, 4. Trimethyl hexanoic acid. Hexanoic acid, the ending says that that's a carboxylic acid. Hexanoic acid, 6 carbons long. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This time, I'll put the, the carboxyl group on the left side. It, it doesn't matter, but I'll put it on the other side just to mix things up. I'll show this time the double bonded O coming down, and I'll put the OH going up. It doesn't matter. The molecule can rotate, and those things can trade places. Then we have 2,3,4-trimethyl. Remember that the carbon with the carboxyl group, that carbon, is carbon-1. So 2, 3, 4, trimethylhexanoic acid. What's its chemical formula? Well, it would have 6 plus 3. It's going to have 9 carbons. So therefore, I start with just 8 carbons. This 8 carbons would have 2N plus 2. It would have 18 hydrogens with it. I take one of those hydrogens away, and then I add on my carboxyl group. So there's 2,3,4-trimethylhexanoic acid. I'll leave you to finish the carboxyl, carboxylic acids, and I'm just going to introduce the, la the third category, esters. Esters are molecules which are created from the reaction between an alcohol which we discussed earlier, and a carboxylic acid. The reaction is referred to as an esterification reaction, a reaction that produces an ester. Now, what does the ester look like? Well, look closely at this reaction. The alcohol on the left, I can see that it's an alcohol because it has that hydroxyl group, OH. The carboxylic acid on the right, I can see that it has a carboxyl group. There it is. All right, so this is telling me an alcohol is reacting with the carboxylic acid. Let me erase that highlighting. In the box, they've highlighted the hydrogen from the hydroxyl group and the OH from the carboxyl group. Those two things are going to combine and they're going to create water, which is one of the products. It's considered a byproduct. We don't really care about the water, but it's being produced. Now, if you, you've played with molecular models in the lab, imagine that you take the hydrogen from that alcohol and pull it off, 
and you take the OH from the carboxylic acid and pull it off. Then you take the remaining part of the alcohol, so you take this part of the alcohol, and you attach it to this part of the carboxylic acid. So where you used to have the H and the OH, those are gone, they've made water. And the O, let me just get rid of some of this highlighting, the O from the alcohol is going to bond directly to the carbon that was in the carboxylic acid. So what you end up getting is an ester. The ester kind of looks like a carboxylic acid. I can see what kind of looks like a carboxyl group, C double bond O with a single bond O. But if it were a carboxylic acid, it would have been bonded with an OH. In an ester, it's with an O and then carbon. So this is what tells me it's an ester. The molecule on the left, let me again just erase my highlighting. So this part of the ester, you might want to highlight that. That part of the ester came from the alcohol. That was from our alcohol up above. While the different color highlighting, this part of the ester, you again might want to highlight this yourself, this was from the carboxylic acid. Okay, so an ester is an acid, carboxylic acid, and an alcohol joined together. Now, if we look at the names of these things, our alcohol had one carbon. So what was the name of that alcohol? Its name with one carbon was methanol. What was the name of the carboxylic acid? Well, it had four carbons, one, two, three, four. So a carboxylic acid with four carbons would be butanoic acid. Then what's the name of this ester? Well, in the name, I'm going to name the alcohol part first, and then I'm going to name the carboxylic acid part second. So look at how we do this. Naming the alcohol part first, I'm going to say methyl. Okay, the alcohol was methanol, but when I name the ester, I just say methyl. The second part of the name, and it's actually a second word, is butan, butan O8. Okay, O8 is the ending of an ester's name. So when I see this weird name, methyl butanoate, two different words, the methyl part is from the alcohol that was used to make it while the butanoate part of the name is from the carboxylic acid that was used to make it. So the alcohol methanol, when it reacts with butanoic acid, will create methyl butanoate. You could also go the other way around. If you tell me an ester is methyl butanoate, butanoate then I know it was made from methanol and butanoic acid, okay? Let's try this with one more example and we'll call it a day. So question 16 shows us a carboxylic acid molecule and an alcohol molecule. Give me their names and write them in the boxes where it says that up above. So that carboxylic acid has four carbons, so we, it's very similar to what we just saw. Butanoic acid is its name. The alcohol here has two carbons, so therefore its name is ethanol. Now down below, we're going to draw and name the ester that would be produced from, these, from this reaction, from this esterification reaction. I can give you its name very simply. First, from the alcohol, we'll say ethyl, because the alcohol was ethanol. And then since the carboxylic acid was butanoic acid, 
the second part of the name of our ester will be butanoate. Now let's draw the ester. When I draw it, I draw the carboxylic acid part first. So four carbons long, one, two, three, four. And then I'm going to draw that carboxyl group like this. And then I'm going to put an oxygen here. But instead of an OH, which is what the, the carboxylic acid has, I know that this oxygen is bonded to carbons. The carbons that are attached here come from the alcohol. The alcohol had two carbons in it, so therefore one, two. Uh, nope, sorry, I just added three carbons. Let me just erase that. So drawing, ah, sorry, there's my oxygen. Attached two carbons do this, one, two. So there's a carbon here, there's a carbon here. So there's my two carbons from the alcohol, okay? So ethyl butanoate, the ethyl part of the name, this ethyl refers to this part of the molecule, while the butanoate with four carbons refers to this part of the molecule. The ethyl came from the alcohol, and the butanoate came from the butanoic acid, all right? So for homework this weekend, you're supposed to complete up to question 19. So a few more examples that are very similar to the one that we just did. Give that a try this weekend, and we're going to jump into some new organic molecules next week.